your children black is beautiful to be alive is a whole lot of privilege education is the key to rule the world you don't need to be white to be a pretty girl tell your children black is beautiful how we not go back for no privilege knowledge is a ruler of the world you don't need to be white to be a pretty girl when your black hair is a big threat we never seen nothing like this yet such a pretty brown skin when you see my melanin you better show some respect So for you, yeah, yo There when never it matters and even more when you feel like it doesn't Protect you so you never feel like you wasn't No, I'm right alongside you, here but that or I'm behind you But always got you, end of discussion, nothing means more First wanna offer his shoulders for what you reach for Thought I saw the eyes of the world until I seen yours <laughs> And know that I ain't see a better view yet I'm with whatever, so don't ever you fret Know that you covered, not a hurdle or a heartbreak To change what a part take Cause none of them won't ever get comfortable in your walkway My job is to aware you, fully loaded, prepare you For all of the above that I'm never letting get near you But still in all, give you every advantage I found Couldn't find a better fit for them, along with my crown And since the baton was passed, I've been down Cause failing's not an option, and dad is not a noun, not at all Welcome to another episode of Dad Is Not A Noun. My name is Ishmael, changing the narrative from men of color fatherhood, as well as changing the narrative on the things I care about. And today I wanna share an interview that I recorded uh, yesterday with the amazing, talented, award-winning director, producer, photographer, world traveler, and just a dope person, B. Monet. And Monet in French, the origin is to be heard. And so on this episode, I utilize my platform for her to be heard because the reality in the film industry, only 4% of black women are film directors. So I wanted her to come on to tell her story, tell her value to the industry, and then also talk about her uh amazing story when it comes to being in the film industry because she's had critically acclaimed film short films like queen as well as the amazing documentary called ballet after dark so i hope you guys enjoy this conversation we have and you know do what you do like subscribe um uh follow me on instagram facebook uh Type in that is not a noun and you'll find me. So enjoy this amazing conversation. All right. And here's the conversation. Wow. What an introduction. I have never had such a beautiful introduction like that. I need you to come with me <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> I'll be your, I'll be I'll be your favorite flavor flavor. How's that? Please, yes, I need that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not gonna be wearing the, the, the big clock. I'm just letting you know it right now. Yeah, we'll we'll find something else. <laughs> <laughs> and I always ask my guests who comes on the show all the time because I'm all about mental health okay. and I'm an advocate for mental health. So how's your heart? Wow. That is a beautiful question. I've never had anyone ask me that ever in an interview. Right now, I would like to say that it's good, which... I don't know. I feel like the last few years, it it hasn't always been good, but in this current moment, it's good. Thank you for asking that. Like that is yeah. so you sweet. And thoughtful. You, can, you can still laugh. Yeah. Still laugh. No, I'm <laughs> like. <laughs> and what I want to do is, I want to start with a poem. Okay. You know, because you know I write poetry. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I've been writing poetry since I was 15. And this poem I wrote, it was inspired by a rapper by the name of Idea. Okay. Uh, it's called Red Balloon. And it kind of reminds me of you. All right. As we get older, we stare at the ceiling instead of staring at the sky. Build mental cubicles as we forget how a red balloon fly. Fly carelessly into the sky like children's curiosity lost in their imagination, where wonder is as vibrant than a rainbow filled with laugh laughter. 
many faces of our possibilities come when we never lose our childhood. And what inspired that piece is that a child's imagination is a powerful thing. And I think as all creators, we get into that childhood imagination to create. So my next question to you in this industry that you're in, how do you keep your childhood imagination? Wow. And thank you for sharing the poem with me. Um, yeah. It's funny because I used to write poetry a lot, um, like as a teenager and write in my journal and sometimes going back to those journal entries. I'm like, girl, life was not that hard. You thought that was hard. <laughs> Anyways. But, <laughs> yeah, it's just like funny to go back to old like, journals and you're like it really wasn't that bad but okay like even if this guy doesn't like you it's fine you didn't you didn't need to go down this path but um in terms of your question in terms of cultivating my childhood I feel like um I don't know if you're familiar with human design yes. but in human design um I'm a projector type and so it's really important that I follow my joy and that I add to that. And so for me, that looks like painting, that looks like watercoloring, that looks like having a great meal, that looks like um, having a great conversation with a friend, going to a play, maybe walking down a street or walking like last night, even though it was cold, I literally walked for almost an hour just down the same street from like bed to like Crown Heights, like just walked all the way down. For me, it's like that exploration. And I know that I feel like sometimes in our community, the black community, we're not allowed to be free. We're not allowed to liberate ourselves and have joy. And so I really wanna radicalize and also like open up what joy looks like, especially as adults. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to just be for kids, but it can be for, you know, grown people too <laughs> and um yes yeah, so, and sometimes joy looks like and imagination looks like reading a good book um writing uh i'm really into like mixed media right. so sometimes like games or virtual games or yeah interactive experiences so i just take it all in i take it all yeah <laughs> no and i think that's important too because the reality is you're a part of that small group. It's four percent of black women that's directors. And a, being a part of that group, that's a lot of pressure. So how do you handle that pressure? Well, I know you know, I'm not sure what everyone's spirituality is like, but I know that I am a believer of Christ and I believe that my faith also very much keeps me anchored and keeps me grounded. Um, I'm not really sure how you can be in this industry without believing in something bigger than yourself. There's so much uncertainty, so much instability. Um, you know, I mean, I don't, I won't get into it, but there was a project before the pandemic that I did all this work on. And I thought this was going to be my first feature film and, you know, it sounded like a great opportunity. I was gonna film in Italy and all this kind of stuff, only to be told two years later, nope. Oh. And that's the kind of thing that happens a lot, unfortunately, in entertainment. And I would love to act like, oh, this just is a one-off experience, but right. it's not. Even a good friend of mine yesterday was telling me how he's been on a project for four or five years. Someone saw, you know, one of his films and was like, yeah, I think we need to reconsider this project. So what keeps me anchored is going to things like the Spike Lee Museum, talking to filmmakers who are coming up and trying to figure out how do I break into commercials? How do I do a short film? Um, how do I get representation? You know, and being that kind of like pillar or mentor in the middle and trying to give someone the keys to the kingdom that I didn't have. And I still don't feel like I 
always have them despite what I think social media shows. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there have been a lot of doors that have opened up for me, but I also feel like I worked my behind off. So I'm not going to act like it was just through osmosis, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I think knowing that we still have so many stories that haven't been told, you know, and when I see a great piece of cinema, like even though I know Jonathan Majors is having all this stuff go on, rewatching Last Black Man in San Francisco and seeing his thought provoking take on that role, you know, it's like more of this, please. You know what I mean? Like, can we have more cinema that shows us in a way that's not traumatized and no baby mama trauma like it's just like just being you know and i think we all deep down just want more stories like that so might be a little cliche but i think watching a lot of stuff that is not great i think (laughs) inspired but then also seeing like oh like a movie like a thousand and one with tiana taylor that came out last year and I'm like, yes, we need more movies like this. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> lots of things. <laughs> no, I, I feel you on that. But like, how, like how, like how do you keep your sanity? Cause I know it's gotta be frustrating. Like oh, yeah. you see slave movies, you see um, just movies that um, untrue and things in that nature. Um, but yeah, how, like, how do you just keep your sanity? Cause sometimes you want to pull your hair out, right? <laughs> yeah. And then you can't be the angry black woman, right? Like, I think especially for me, navigating commercials is really difficult. Um, because also, although I've been able to get a lot of commercials and be a voice in that arena, um, you know, it's hard when you're dealing with clients and brands and you're the only spot of color on the call. Or, you know, it's me and maybe, you know, the talent that I have to direct is black or of color, but everyone else around me is white. And, you know, if I decide to get angry or be sassy, is that really the best way to handle myself in this moment? I think you still need to be assertive in these spaces and speak up when, you know, things aren't going the way that you plan or you you need a whistle blow and say, hey, we need to work on this thing. But I think it's also being very strategic and knowing when to pick your battles because I think you can't always be nagging, you know, at every point. So, yeah, <laughs> I would say... It's something I'm still navigating. I think I don't always have enough peers, you know, to actually ask like, hey, can you can you give advice here? You know, because I think sometimes a lot of people think I might be blame I might be complaining because they want to be where I am I'm at. And so it's I think it's like I miss that elder um ship in our community where older generations would hand the baton and say, hey, I see you're going over here, but let's go over here. You know what I mean? And I just wish that there was a bit more of that in our community and just in general, like no matter what color you are, just it's like, oh, you haven't done this yet. Let me help you. Or, oh, I see you need a DP here. Let me give you a suggestion. So it's I don't know. Sometimes I'm just like, I hear the whole thing of like, oh, you need to find your people. But I don't think that's always easy, you know, Um, or at least it hasn't been for me. Because sometimes you kind of worry, too. Have you been in a situation where, you know, you thought you had community, but at the same time, you realized they had their own hidden agenda? All the time. Um, And I think it's hard when it comes from people who look like you. And you're like, oh, like, (laughs) you crazy too. Got it. All right. And it's hard. (laughs) Like, (laughs) it's like, oh, I was thinking maybe this time, you know, oh, we're, we'd be on some community and not crabs in a barrel stuff. Got it. Okay. But it's, it's a very tricky business to navigate and you don't know who knows who, 
Um, I oftentimes feel like a fish out of water. Even when I was at NYU, I didn't really feel like I had like a lot of allies who had my back. Um, and so I would kind of find my community from different classes or outside of film school. And I think even since then, it's just been the same road for me, unfortunately, where I just have kind of, I just feel like if, I, if you're dope and you're incredible, cool. That's, and you're not a dick, great. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> that's what it is. Like, you know, cause I've done so many programs, been a part of so many initiatives and have tried to cultivate community, but it just, it gets also annoying and taxing. Where it's right. like, why am I sending all these grants out to people who don't think enough of me to maybe send back grants too, or opportunities as well? I've sent out tons of jobs and things to people just cause. Right. And I think at some point I'm just like, it would be nice to just feel like there's more of a mutual sure. situation and reciprocity going on here and not feeling like my tank is constantly empty and I'm just pouring out and giving all of this knowledge and wisdom and whatever. But yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, you but. Did. You definitely, definitely <laughs> did. But can you, without go, going into detail, can you tell me a scenario when you said no to someone and it was therapeutic for you? Recently, I just did something with, actually with Taraji, um, it's for Always Discreet. And I did that job with her. And the company that I did it with was angry and mad that they approached me about a new opportunity. And because I didn't go, basically in advertising, because I didn't go with their company for something else, they got mad at me. But there was another company, It's I'm trying to make sure I'm explaining this correctly, but there was another company that hit me up about the same opportunity. Essentially, the pre the company with the Taraji opportunity hit me up 20 minutes later. Mm -hmm. So they were mad that another company hit me up 20 minutes before they did and that I wasn't going with them. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's weird because it's like, you don't own me, um, you know, I'm not one of your directors on your roster. I appreciate this opportunity, but her 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 tone was very dismissive towards me. And I did not like it and I did not care for it. And I think that's also something that I didn't know that I'd have to navigate is saying no to things. Right. I think because sometimes, at least for me, for a long time, I was kind of like, in this survival mentality and I just have to say yes to all the jobs because if I don't say yes, I'm never going to get anything else. Right. But I think that comes from like this, you know, upbringing. It comes from like our trauma as black people in this country, in this world. And so I thought that was a radical act for me to say no to someone who I feel like it was just a weird dynamic. Right. And sometimes I think, and fortunately with film, you know, it's similar to, I, I think like an NFL, NBA situation where it's just very interesting how it just feels like certain filmmakers are cherry picked or will allow you to tell a story, but not you because you're, right. it's similar to all the things I feel like Cat Williams is talking about in comedy i would still say that it happens in film too so and and that's the reality too but at the same time it's strength saying no because you you understand your value because i know that's the one thing in the media is tahara p henson um being frustrated not get being paid her value in the industry um right. so like just talk about yourself personally uh, um, of a, like a scenario or like a situation where you aren't getting paid your value. Cause again, you have um, a list of credentials in the game, but right. you're not a white male director or a white woman director. Your mm -hmm. pay scale is a lot different than your other counterparts. Yeah, I mean, and <laughs> your brother knows about <laughs> this and just sometimes we'll talk 
about that. And he's just like, the budgets I see these white boys getting, man, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, I know. And I, it's a very frustrating thing because like what I was telling you earlier is people will want to direct commercials, but don't understand that you're also, when you're directing commercials, you're in servitude of the brand, of the client, of the agency to a certain extent, even though they're the middleman between you and the client, you got a lot of other people, a lot of other hens, I call them, that you're dealing with. And I've noticed in terms of like with pay and like the budget range, I would just say that I feel like I've been stuck. Like, I feel like I'm not getting the bigger budgets for whatever reason. I understand that I'm not technically DGA, which means Directors Guild of America. Like I'm not a DGA um, director. So that means I'm not a union director, but I've worked with A-list talent. Um, I've done a lot of non-union shoots and that kind of thing. But I would, I would say that I've done also a lot of things and I've won a lot of awards. And I would definitely say that I'm not seeing unfortunately, this major increase in terms of with the budgets, they've little by little gotten better from like last year to this year, even though this year just started, but I don't know. And I, I'm not sure if maybe things will change if I become in the union, but I've been kind of also leery of becoming union because it just gets really hard when you as a director become union because then they don't want you to be working on non-union things. And it just is a whole thing, but um, yeah, it's, it's difficult as a black woman um, always fighting. I feel like every set I'm like, Oh, it'll be different. And it's always something. If it's not pay, it's respect. If it's not respect, it's microaggressions. If it's not microaggressions, it's not wanting to cast someone that you're like, hey, can we maybe cast someone dark skin? Can we maybe cast someone with kinky hair? Like, and it's just like everything is a fight. And so it's just it can it can nick away at you. And I think even with being successful, I think for me, I have to make things that are that are important to me, which is why this year I'm like, I have to get back to making passion projects and work that matters to me because just working in advertising is very, is very draining. It's very draining. Yes, it's great for the pockets, but that's about it. Unless you're like, you know, one of these white male directors, then yeah but do you worry about i call it the steve urkel theory like um you get tight cast um do you worry about that with your career that you you'll you'll be tight cast as just doing commercials well i mean i don't think that i will i okay maybe everyone is to a certain extent right like i don't think I'm trying to be typecast, but I think that unfortunately this world has a way of still saying she's really good at this. I've already had it happen with me in the commercial sense where different companies will be like, well, you're really good at documentaries. You're really great at beauty, um, really good at like lifestyle, celebrity mm, and like YA, young adults, like that's where we stick you and maybe some automobiles, but we not, we're not going to like have you do that really cool VR thing with like, you know, that's like $1.2 million. You don't get that one. Right. And it's just like, why not? I can do all these other things, but why can't I do the cool interactive gaming thing as well? You know, so I, I find it very challenging getting bigger budgets. And I, sometimes I don't know what to do. And I feel like I almost like, I feel like I'm in a space where I have to rebrand myself right. and restart over. And I think that that's extremely hurtful um, just because I feel like I don't, I shouldn't have to do that. And I don't know, I'm trying to wrap myself around like just giving it all that I got and like 
doing as much as I can, but um, I'm not going to act like it's not really hurtful to feel like when you feel like you're owed right. certain things, you know, and I think that's what Taraji basically is saying is like, I literally have her, I mean, has literally almost won an Oscar and for her pay not to increase for her budgets of, you know, the projects that she's working on or the caliber of the work to right. expand, it's hard. And a lot of this is gatekeeping. A lot of this is you need management. You know, you need a manager, an agent, all these other hens to get you the opportunity, but then you got to give them th their percentage, you right. know, which is also just like, ah, uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> it's like playing the game of Russian roulette at the end of the day. You know, it's like you damn if you do, you damn if you don't. Um, but I think you muted yourself. <laughs> No, I do, I do, because I don't know how much of the background noise you're getting, so I'm trying to, like... Oh, no, you're good. Uh, no background noise. You're good. You're okay. good. You're good. Um, my next question, how has technology impact the way we create movies? Because now, you know, the big, not the big thing, but everything is streaming service now. You know, mm -hmm. you see the decline of people going to movie theater. So when you create a film, is it the mindset... Uh, this is just going to be streaming service or I'm going to make this directly yeah. from the theater. It's funny you say that. Like I have, I can't really talk about it much, but I have like a feature documentary coming out soon. And I, as someone who, you know, I'm a filmmaker, storyteller. I've always wanted that theatrical situation where my first film is in theaters, people are watching it and that's what you want as a filmmaker, you know? So to not have that, I think, robs us of the joy of why we create, because so much of it is about having that beautiful experience with an audience. So to be ripped away and not have that experience, I think, robs us as storytellers and the audience, because, yeah, you can watch something now in the comforts of your living room or whatever, but I think it's just really sad to just see, like... I don't know. I think it's just so sad to see like things change so much. Like, yes, it's easier to watch stuff, but I think we as humans still need to interact, you know, and still have conversations after a movie and to say, hey, were you interpreting this the same way as me? Or what did you think about this scene? Or how did that make you feel? And I just feel like all this virtual stuff is just... I think it's just gonna like suppress human connection in a way. I mean, it's already happening. Um, like I'll be on the subway and just to like look around and see so many people so glued to their phones. I think movies are kind of headed to that direction where people are watching Netflix on their commutes to work or, you know, as they're going home. And so I think it's just gonna be more on the SVOD, which just means like streaming video on demand platforms, even places like Tubi, we might yeah. see them making a jump or a leap because I think also people are hungry for other types of stories. And so I think that's why Netflix, because they've lost money is why they're increasing their subscription. But then you'll have places like Tubi seeing an increase in viewership and subscriptions because people wanna see especially black folks, we want to see ourselves in a multitude of roles and spaces. So, yeah. And I think AI, before you know it, I think we'll probably be seeing films made, you know, <laughs> with... Yeah, it's already there. Yeah. It's already here. Yeah. Because I know that was one of the big things in the negotiation um, to, and the, yeah. the strike was the uh the actors they didn't want ai where the mm -hmm. uh they wanted it and they were able to not have it in the contract but yeah it is there and it's not going anywhere i mean i think things are just going to ramp up i mean there's so much i mean even i used ai the other day to help me write um you know, a song because I'm working on a short film and there's a singing component. And I'm like, I don't know anyone right now who can help me in the wee hours of the morning 
write a song. So I'm going to get back into my poetry game and I'm going to also like use this software and see how much it can help me. And I'm like, I let them know this is a temp song, but it was just interesting to be like, literally, this is canceling out potentially someone's job or it could, Mm -hmm. right? Like instead of going to a composer or a songwriter, I could just go on this website and it's helping me. And it's just like, it helps my pocketbooks, but I just think it gets a little dicey when it comes to people who have worked only in that particular craft and yeah. now they may not get hired, you know, in the future. So I don't know. I think we have to make peace with AI and make it work for ourselves, but also like never, I guess, never stop trying to create your own opportunities too. So, because AI yeah. is, it's not going nowhere. I don't think. <laughs> fact, fact. And then um, just talk about your love and passion for photography. Cause that's another passion of yours. Yeah. Talk about that. It's funny because photography, I think for me, just allows me to like get back into the love of filmmaking. Um, it and it also is like less less hens, meaning mm-hmm. like with filmmaking, there's so many other people and personalities and egos and management of that that you have to deal with. And sometimes photography is just like, oh, I can just take this moment. It will live in time the way that I framed it. I don't have to worry about any outside voices, any outside opinions. It's just me, a camera, and the subject. And I love it. And I'm just like, sometimes I wish filmmaking could be a little bit more insulated like that, where it's just less people like like I love people but people just they can be a lot and sometimes you know a lot of artists are sensitive and if you don't agree with them they might have a problem with that then navigating also being a black woman and being young and this it's like whoo <laughs> can we just get back to the subject so Going back to your your question, yeah, I love photography. I've been doing it since I was in high school. Took a black and white um, class. My dad bought me my first 35 millimeter little camera, like, you know, my little Minolta camera that just takes like film. And it was just, it's been me and my cameras ever since, you know, but <laughs> I um, very much appreciate my dad seeing the foresight and being like, if this is something you want to do, whatever you want, we will find a way. And I truly believe that my parents have been also been my guiding light and my late grandmother, um, you know, as to why I've been able to also like stay with this and my little sister and seeing her wanting to do more films. So I think those folks have very much anchored me when I have been like, why am I doing this? Why am I sacrificing so much of this? Why am I missing my friend's baby shower or wedding for this thing? You know, so they've they've definitely been my guiding light, I would say as well. And then also with you traveling the world and with your camera, (laughs) have you found community abroad more than you found community in the States? And why? Yeah, oddly enough, I feel like, I don't know, when I'm elsewhere, I just kind of feel at peace. Like I say all the time, like I could move to Costa Rica and be just fine. Um, I I mean, I need to learn to speak fluent Spanish too, if that ever happened. But I don't know. I think... I don't, maybe it's also the reason why a lot of foreign, I mean, black Americans went abroad because maybe we could have a safe space outside of the States. And maybe, unfortunately, and maybe this is wrong to say, we're considered foreign to them. Right. So because we're considered foreign or exotic to maybe people who are Parisian or 
to people in London or whatever, they treat us better. It's not right because they should be treating all Africans who migrate to these different countries better and great as well. But I think that there's something nice to just sometimes being out of this US bubble. And I don't know, I also find with social media, there's so much happening with us. I feel like there's been this like rigorous overload between learning about Kat, learning about Taraji, learning about Palestine, learning about all these things, the shade room, that it's almost like, is there any good in the world? Like, and I think my camera and traveling allows me to remember that human humanity and humans are beautiful still, and that there's a lot of good people out here in the world who are willing to help you and want to make you laugh. And it's also just very interesting to me, people who have so little have so much in other countries, and yet we have so much here, but it feels like so little because we're always like just focused on the wrong thing. So yeah, I don't know. I, I look forward to the days when I can just like go somewhere else. I'm like, yes, sign me up. I get to leave the States. Yay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I never thought that I'd be this way, but I think studying abroad like helped me to become this like global citizen. And um, yeah, oh my God, queen. And oh, this is my little baby. This, you know, I'm a person that's all about detail. You know me. Um, talk about the significance of this poster and why did you choose those cassette tapes in the poster? Well, if you look, and thank you for bringing this back. Wow, I haven't seen this Full in circle. a second. Yeah, I know. I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, um, okay. You know, I um, I don't know, I'm a little speechless because this is the project that means so much to me. And I really, really, really one day want to make it, but I wanna make it on my own terms. And that is why there's been a lot of delays with it. And just trying to assemble the right team has been challenging. Um, but in terms of with the short, if you notice, you'll see different tracks and things like that. And my production designer, who's from London, um, was very instrumental in doing that. That is his doing. I can't take credit for that at all. I just gave him a lot of designs and um, what is it, inspiration. And he came up with the tracks that you see on there. But we made sure that a lot of her room was kind of like pink and reds and blues and purples and that kind of thing. And I think that's kind of also my vibe in terms of with another project that I'm working on, just showing adolescence and kind of like that cross between being, you know, a teenager and then trying to launch yourself into adulthood. And what does that show and how do you, embrace the new colors you know what i mean the new parts of yourself that sometimes you you can't you know as a little girl but as a young woman you have to start you know charting your way and being that phoenix like that rises above all of that so yeah i just i'm still a little speechless because <laughs> <laughs> I, I was about to go deep on it because i'm like the reason why the two short cassette tapes there is to understand the mis not misogyny in, in hip hop towards women. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you say that. I mean, I made sure, you know, with Queen, we made sure that there was no use of the N word. There were no men. Like she wasn't competing against a man. Like during the behind the scenes, what we would do is we would have you know, men and other people perform, but when it came to the actual competition, it was two women. And I really am someone who loves lyricists, people like Rhapsody, people like Immortal Technique, Currency, uh, Nas, like people who are like truly poets, you know, Lauren Hill, like they can attack you with their words. And I feel like we're not living in a time where 
I feel like rappers are really using their lyrics with power. You know, I think it's just, yeah, it's just very sad. So I feel like seeing this makes me want to like, be like, yes, also rappers who, where are you? There's a good, there's a girl name. Oh man, her name is like Petty, Petty something out of Queens. I met her last year. This girl is incredible. She, I'd have to go on my Instagram to find her again, but she would be an amazing Imani, you know, mm -hmm. she like in the, like she is, I don't know. I have no words, but that girl needs to blow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe her time is going to come, hopefully. But what I worry about in this time of um, music, streaming music and things like that, you know, it's hard for artists to make money. <laughs> you know, what is it like a penny of a dollar for each streaming <laughs> song get streamed? So if you, yeah. if you play 100,000 streams, that's nothing. I know. I'm just like, how are big artists making it? What do you think? Like, how are they making They're making it? They're making tour. That's their money, branding and tour. And maybe merch? And merch. And then they have other um, business opportunities. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I think that's also really sad, right? To be like, you've slaved over this amazing album, but then to still see, you know, you may not get that big opportunity or the numbers don't make sense. And I think music and film are very similar that way where it's all about the numbers yeah. and you know, your less, your last album is indicative to your last movie. How did it perform? Did people come and support you? Like whether it's a tour or it's the movie, did they come out? Yeah. And um it's sad that a lot of us are reduced to numbers, even with like social media. I find that people just want to like see my Instagram or anyone's Instagram because it's like we need to see how important you are. And it's just like, can we just get each other's numbers? Like, what's your math? Like, I don't, I don't have time for this. <laughs> you know? No, it's, it's true. But the reality is that um, the one thing is that technology dictates music movies all entertainment so wherever tech whoever in charge of technology is going to dictate the entertainment industry because if you go back to uh, what was that what was that um before itunes that was that um what was that um soundcloud that, not soundcloud the company that was still in uh music limewire lime before limewire uh, they did a documentary and the guy who worked for that company, it, I think he's still, he's in charge of Spotify now. Oh, I don't know. What is this? I'm like, I'm curious. <laughs> now. <laughs> but, but, like, where is but, but what the one thing is that, that, that company that did that iTunes took their idea of how to stream music. And that's how iTunes got big. Well, that's why everyone's got to be careful with sharing their ideas. And I think even though I loved Clubhouse when it was like really made its launch during the, um, the pandemic, I found that people were just like sharing their ideas like on there like crazy. And I'm just like, you don't understand. Like someone could just take your idea and, you know, you can't really say anything because you literally just gave them all your IP I mean, and maybe you would do it differently than how you're presenting it, but don't be mad if someone takes your <laughs> your thing. You like, know? You know, did you hear the story out about the gentleman? Well, I think his name is Jared, and okay. he did like a trailer of being the son of uh, Apollo. Yes, um... <laughs> and he put it on social media, tag. Sylvester Stallone in it, and he lost his case saying that they stole his idea for Creed. <laughs> but this is what I'm saying. I know. I knew like <laughs> people are losing it. I'm just like, 
<laughs> we're living in the wild, wild west, like the yeah. wild, wild west. <laughs> but then you think about things like Bel Air, right? Where the yeah. filmmaker was like, I really want to redo Bel Air and I want to do my own take on it. And now look at it. It's, it has, I think, almost like it'll have three seasons soon. So uh, tomato, tomato, like I think social media has its pros. It has its cons. But um, yeah, and then it's hard when you have people rally behind you, especially Black Twitter or Black X. When it takes right. over, forget it. Like it's a wrap. Yeah, yeah. But that's a, that's that's the one thing. Like the difference with like social media. Like they'll talk it, but when it comes to actually like dollar sign where it matters, that's a different story. Oh yeah. I mean. <laughs> How many times have you been in a situation where you're like, girl, I can't wait till your movie come out. It's going to be dope. I love it. And it's like, <laughs> okay. And they don't come out or they don't, you know, like, like for example, you know, I was a part of a team that uh, had a Kickstarter for animation. Okay. Called Ajaka. We got the funding. The animation is out. but. Okay. The funniest thing someone put in a comment, like, if I support your Kickstarter, can I have a certain percentage of the IP? And we <laughs> looked at the comment, what? like, oh, you fucking crazy. <laughs> Are you crazy? No. no. We, this and is you just hard say support it, like, put, like, $10, whatever, just support it. But, yeah, like, oh, can I get a portion? I was like, no, you cannot. <laughs> Oh my God! Everybody is looking for a get rich quick scheme. I think now everybody wants the soft life. Everybody wants to be flown out, and it's like, oh, we're gonna find a way to have stock or have a percentage, and you're gonna give us some of that. What? Um, be happy with a t-shirt and a shout out. You see your- <laughs> and, that's, and that's what we did with the animation. Is like at the end, we had all the names who supported the Kickstarter. Oh, I mean, everybody should be happy for that, okay? You still were acknowledged, but when you start asking for this, that, and the third... I'm not going to get it. Okay. Even even the <laughs> large donors didn't act for that. Like, the large donors, they were able to get their image in the animation. I, I'm I'm sorry for this person's tackiness, this tacky <laughs> request. Because it's just like the audacity. Like you really have some balls for asking that. Like, yeah, it's, 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 I'm just we like just started laughing. It was just too funny. <laughs> no, I I feel like I have the opposite in return, where I have people who, you know, they'll come to like the ballet after dark screening, or they'll come to. Like if this film ends up having like a screening or whatever, they'll come, but it's almost like hate watch. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're coming, but they're not coming to actually support me. They're just trying to prove that they're better than me. Like that's the vibe that I get from people where it just doesn't feel genuine. So I think it's because the arts brings apart a lot of insecure people. They come with that that energy. And because I'm a very sensitive soul, I feel a lot. So it's like, they may not say it ever, but I sense it and feel it from their disposition and their actions. So like I said, it's very hard. I think just being in the arts where you have a genuine soul, but yet it's a lot of darkness, (laughs) you know, I feel like I'm like constantly like slaying dragons like i'm just like oh i slayed one all right now right. i gotta get ready to get my <laughs> combat boots up for another right one. <laughs> you know so it's I like just like a bunch of gremlins they just multiply yeah kind of i mean i hate to make it sound <laughs> gruesome but i always am in interviews i'm very transparent and i'm not gonna lie and act like entertainment is this beautiful thing with no problems and everyone is super friendly and kind and it's not to say you can't find some but there are a lot of people you have to just you know 
have your you might have to have your sword out. Not literally, I have to say that. Nah, you don't want to catch a case. You don't want that. Please. <laughs> <laughs> you you seen what happened to Jonathan Bajor, so I'm gonna just leave it like that. God, I you know, I didn't really follow it because I like the case and everything because I'm just like, oh, please let this not be true. Like, oh my God, no, not Jonathan. Like he's such a great actor. Oh, you know what I mean? And and also I just wasn't sure like if it was another thing of like every time a black man is successful here, you know, Hollywood mm -hmm. is, the different entities are to just like make, um, you know, it difficult for him, but, you know, it does seem like he also has had a pass with, right. you know, <laughs> hurting folks. So I'm just like, oh, Jonathan, I was rooting for you. I'm still rooting for you, but I, but I also want you to get some help, you know. Yeah, so. You probably got to um, meet with uh, Jack Nicholson, anger management, get that, get that. Yeah. <laughs> Or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> but I don't know but, either. <laughs> but this has been a dope conversation, man. This has been awesome. We gotta do this again, man. Please. Seriously, please. I, I beg of you. We gotta do this again. <laughs> you don't have to beg. You got it. <laughs> please, baby, baby, oh, please, baby, baby, please, please, please. please. <laughs> Try not to make this laptop fall it's on my lap, but <laughs> <laughs> so what's so what's so so what's next? What 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 do you have to say? Ah oh, I'm screaming. <laughs> um what is next? Okay, so I'm working on a short film. Um I can say it because it's been out there. Uh, working on a short film with a studio and soon as it's done, I will promote it, but it'll be coming out on a streaming service. And then the documentary that I have, it'll be coming out on the streaming service very soon. So between those two projects, I feel like I'll be posting about those a lot. And then I just want to keep working on passion projects and keep like making my finding my joy, you know what I mean? And painting and writing and traveling and maybe doing more photography, you know, like I would love to, I don't know, like maybe figure out a way to do like an installation project, you know, mm -hmm. as well one of these days. So yeah, your girl is just, she out here finding her way. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And whatever you do, I'll definitely support. And you always Thanks have so a home much. on this podcast. So <laughs> you just hit me up, say, Ish, I got something going on. Or Ish, just just uh load it up. I want to talk some shit. <laughs> I got something on my chest. I need to I need to air okay. it out. <laughs> Cause I don't feel like sometimes I don't know, like I said, because I've I don't have a lot of examples, especially as black woman directors right. of you know, just sometimes people I can talk to. I thank God for brothers, you know, in this space who are listening ear, but sometimes, you know, you want that that womanly energy too. And it's just hopefully that can change <laughs> this year. Oh. Um, but we'll see. And if it oh. doesn't, it's all good. I, I have good people in my life who have my back and as long as I got a few, that's <laughs> yeah, right, right. hopefully yeah. people watching uh, the current uh, purple color kind of kind of help them find their way. I don't know. I just put well, it <laughs> I honest, I know, but I honestly also feel like because of Taraji, yes, expressing herself, I think it may have caused maybe like a riff with like because they haven't made their numbers. So I'm wondering if like her expressing herself if it caused more harm than helping, but I don't know. But I also feel like she needed to whistle blow and speak her truth. So it's hard, but I hope that people will find a way to still like support the film and a new great director who is 
killing it. I mean, I thought his take on Color, Pur Color Purple was really great, especially like the musical aspects of it. Um, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> Me neither. But this has been another amazing conversation here on the podcast. Um, like, subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, um, Spotify, Google. Dad is not a now. You'll find me. You'll find everything. B, thank you so much. Again, this is your <laughs> home, your platform. So anytime you want to come on, you're welcome to come on. And we're out. Peace. <laughs> All right. Stay on for a second. <laughs>